Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Harry Brelsford here, and I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day, as always, for the weekly webinar. It's 12 noon on the West Coast. Uh, you might have noticed with the weekly webinar, we've shifted the time up. Uh, there's a lot of context surrounding that, but it was, uh, quite, quite frankly, a, a better way for us to accommodate as many time zones as we reasonably can. So uh, Australia, New Zealand in particular can wake up very early. Asia can wake up early and catch us. Uh, Europe can stay up very late, although it's not that late over in Europe. It's uh, coming up certainly deep into the uh, the happy hour, um, eight, nine hours over in Europe, uh, 3 p.m. over on the East Coast, and then again here on the West Coast it's lunch. Um, so Grant is just uh, logging on, uh, so I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping up until that point. So we have a series of webinars um, coming up that I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. This is the first of three. Um, this week in Seattle, uh, interestingly, we had the Microsoft MVP Summit. Uh, that's an annual event. So there's a couple thousand MVPs, including um, tens of MVPs that are in our realm, the SMB realm, the server realm, and so on. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, a lot of you would know names like Wayne Small and Stephen Banks and and so on. So they've been here uh, the last four or five days. Um, the summit is uh, wrapping up today with some individual product meetings, but you're welcome to Google uh, MVP Summit and see what they've been up to. The, the MVPs, that's an honorary award, and uh, they are brought in each year to work with the product teams, typically under NDA, to, to see what the next great thing is, and so on. And then that's how they provide um, great support out in the community. So that shout out to the MVPs, appreciate the work you do. and Still hoping to kind of get together with a couple of them tomorrow before they uh, they, they, they head back to Australia and Europe and across the country and so on. Uh, let's talk for a moment. Uh, by the way, while I'm talking, go to your chat window. If you could open the chat window in the control panel of Go to Webinar. Um, and if, if you could open that up and you'll see that I put a, uh, a Trump URL, uh, a public relations agency just uh, sent me a press release that this Trump Trump Yourself Oversight has launched. Um, go ahead and check it out on screen number two. Now keep an eye on our webinar, of course, but uh, it's 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 kind of fun, you know. That's that's why we're here is you got to have a little bit of fun along the way. Now, more seriously, um, looking out into the future, our crystal ball will have our uh, city by city tour kick off at this point in January. Um, or we're going to be talking about Office 365 and, and Windows 10. That's a one-day workshop that travels. And what's cool about that is uh, we found that's a popular format that no hotel, no air travel um, allows you to come. Quite frankly, our biggest competitor out of all of that motion, and believe me, we're as frustrated as you, but our biggest competitor is the traffic. So... Uh, as we get closer, we'll talk about that, but, but be sure to leave early in the morning in every city anywhere to get to the, uh, the one-day seminars on time, typically start at 9 a.m. So why are we here? We are here for the next three weeks to do a deep dive into Windows 10. And there's, there's uh, so it's a series of webinars, so we'll look forward to seeing you next week and thereafter. And what, what's going on is uh, uh, with the generous uh, support of Microsoft, we're able to bring this webinar series to you. And we want to give a shout out to the Microsoft uh, Community um, Connections Group, the MCC Group. And, and the idea is a couple fold, is, is that you would register for the webinar, but you would also create an MCC event. We're going to get you more details on that on a follow-up email but you would bring your customers to the webinar. Um, that's private only to you, so, so don't worry about, you know, what, what, what I would call channel conflict. Uh, that's not going to exist because the names aren't exposed. But the idea would be you bring the customers to the webinar and use it as uh, a sales motion, um, a nurturing motion for yourself to have people get excited about Windows 10 and, and quite frankly, plan for the adoption of Windows 10. Um, I'd, We'll, we'll go into it over the next three webinars, but I would certainly 
um, encourage you to have a planning mentality about it, not just uh, accept the little dialog box that pops up on your laptop saying upgrade to Windows 10 now. Um, so we're going to go through all the deployment scenarios and the planning scenarios and so on. That's really more of webinar two. But again, we're going to have a uh, special language um, out to you about inviting your customers to come to this webinar. So it's sort of a dual audience webinar. And then, and then quite frankly, our good friends over at Microsoft uh, get uh, karma, good karma, by having you support the MCC program, which, which we're certainly ardent fans of. It's amazing. And it's uh, fantastic. So I see Grant has uh, just uh, gotten in from some Seattle traffic. Grant, you're coming in on the control panel. And we'll get this party started. Thank you very much, folks, for being patient. Um, we have an action-packed hour. Good morning or good afternoon, Grant. How, uh, how's life in the fast lane, sir? I see you just coming in. And we're going to hand over the presenter capabilities to Grant. Jenny, if you could coordinate that over in the control room, if you could make sure Grant is the presenter. Looks like you've done so. And uh, hello. I sir. am. Welcome I am aboard. here. Excellent. My sincere well, apologies for being late. No, no problem, sir. It's just that's life in Seattle, the darn traffic and rain and weather and all sorts of nonsense. Um, Grant, we're a couple minutes in. I want to jump right into it. So, sir, I'm going to I'm going to go on mute. I, I for for once I get a I get to listen for a little while then I'll, I'll I'll bug you along the way. How's that sound? Sounds great. Thank you very much. Um, well, welcome everybody again. My uh, apologies for being late. Um, we'll jump right into this brief introduction about me uh, and the company I work for. Uh, my name is Grant Thompson. I'm a founding partner of MG Technology Group or MG Tech Group, as people are fond of calling us. Um, we're a cloud services company based in Seattle with data centers in Seattle and Portland. Um, so we do a lot of hosting of uh, Office 365, Azure uh, applications, ERP systems, and things of that nature. Um, today we're going to be focusing on uh, Windows 10 and talking about uh, 10 killer features in Windows 10. Um, I've been using it since uh, a little bit before it came out. I, I usually jump on these things very early, um, and this one just with other things going on at work, I didn't jump onto it uh, in preview, but uh, got onto it right before it went uh, live back at the end of July. And I have to say it's a fantastic uh, operating system. Um, it's an unbiased opinion. We don't sell Windows, so uh, and it's free. Um, but truly, it's a, it's a huge step up. And so hopefully you learn some things today. Um, I think we have somebody moderating. So if there are questions, um, by all means, ask. And I'm happy to address those as best I can. Yeah. That, that, that be me, Grant. So folks, be sure to use the oh. chat feature to ask your questions. <laughs> Thanks, Harry. Um, so let's jump right into this here. And the first thing uh, that I wanted to do is share a quick story. Harry, you've heard this one, uh, but this is actually a, a recent story. Um, up until uh, August of this year, um, I used a Surface Pro 2, uh, kind of an older device now, uh, but I really loved it. Uh, very mobile, very productive, um, just a fantastic thing. And I'm a creature of habit. so. Uh, every morning when I get up and I go out to my car to go to work, I usually have a cup of coffee, a thermos with me, and my backpack with my tablet and you know any papers I need for the day in it. And I put those uh, the backpack in my back seat, and I climb in the front seat with my coffee, and off I go. So one morning, late August, uh, I go out to, to get in my car, and my key fob doesn't work. And uh, the car I drive... It's not old, but it's plagued with electrical issues, so my battery was dead, and I thought, oh, boy, you know, at least I'm not in a hurry this morning to get to work, so I can go grab the van and, and jumpstart the car. So I set my backpack and my coffee cup down by my rear passenger door in order to, um, you know, be able to put it in when I, could, when I could get in. Since the key fob didn't work, I had to use the little manual key to get into the driver's door, so I got the car jump-started. And uh, I, I typically I'm in a rush, and so I thought, you know, this morning I'm not in a rush. I'm going to take the time to put the jumper cables back in their little case and park my wife's car back in 
the driveway where it belongs. And so I got all that stuff done and I thought it's so much better when you take the time to do things right and you're not, you know, panicked or rushed. And so I was feeling really good. I hopped in my car, which was obviously now running, and I put it in reverse and I drive backwards and I hear this loud pop. And I think, gosh, what could that be? That was really odd. And then I remembered that I'd left my coffee cup and my backpack outside the car. And so I thought, man, I must have run over my coffee cup. It's a good thing I didn't run over my backpack. So I hop out of my car. Of course, my coffee cup, my thermos had exploded. It was completely flat. And my backpack was there. It had gone uh, underneath the undercarriage, luckily in between the tires. So I tossed it in the back seat. And then it kind of dawned on me that I, I better open my backpack and see that everything is in fact okay. So I opened it and I took my surface out and this is what it looked like. Um, it had flipped upside down on the undercarriage of the vehicle and it was completely dead. I did try to turn it oh on, my. although that probably wasn't the smartest thing. Um, so anyway, um, that that was completely dead and this is about 9.30 or so in the morning at this point. And so I picked up the phone. I called our insurance company. We have great insurance on our computers. You could do the same thing with like an extended warranty policy. I know Microsoft has them on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they said, no problem. We'll take care of it. Uh, so I called the Microsoft store, which for me is about an hour and a half away because uh, I live and work on an island. So I've got to catch a ferry to get into Seattle. Um, but I called them and said, hey, do you have any, uh, you know, surfaces in stock? Of course they did. So I hopped on the ferry, went over there, bought a Surface Pro 3 at the time. Uh, too bad this didn't happen a little later or I'd have a 4. Uh, but anyway, I ran over there. I grabbed my brand new computer. And most people, I think, at this point would be completely panicked because of the data that's on this device. Um, not only is the data here protected um, on uh, the version of Windows I was running with BitLocker from somebody stealing it, uh, but because of Windows 10, which was running on this device, um, my, I knew that my data was safe, that even though this device didn't work anymore, that I hadn't lost anything. And so I went and I picked up my new uh, Surface on the ferry ride back. I logged into my Office 365 account and got all my applications back. Uh, my backups run at home for me, so I went straight home and uh, turned on my Surface once I got in there and logged onto my network, and it said, you have a backup available, do you want to restore? I said, yes. About 15 minutes later, all my data was back on my computer without me doing anything but saying yes and entering the password for my uh, backup storage, and then off I went to work. So in about four hours, I went from having flattened my laptop with a car going and buying a brand new device, having it back with all my settings, all of my applications, and all my data. And I mean, the downtime I lost really was the fact that I live so far from a place to get a new device. And it's not specific to the Surface. This is really a Windows 10 story. Um, yep. So you definitely want to make sure that you turn on backup. Um, it's not, you have to set it up, which just takes just a few minutes. Uh, very easy to do and then through its synchronization with the cloud through OneDrive all your settings are saved there so it knows uh, you know knows your wallpaper and all the all the different things you need so I was back up and running very quickly so while that's not in my list of 10 killer features that is one that's a lifesaver for me and I think uh, for most people's quite impressive well Grant if you're gonna uh, do that again just warn us there's there's women and children on this webinar and that's a pretty scary photo so <laughs> Will do, thank you. Um, so let's talk about the start menu for uh, a minute. And, uh, you know, for most of you on the call, you may be running Windows 7 or Windows 8 or 8.1, depending on uh, how up to date your Windows is. A lot of people in small business are still on Windows 7. They bought a PC with it um, and to pay to upgrade uh, may not have been motivating or that may not have made sense for them. People who are on newer devices probably are on Windows 8.1. Um, one of the things that happened between Windows 7 and Windows 8, as most of you are aware, is the start button disappeared. Uh, they brought it back in Windows 8.1 in a limited fashion. And then now in Windows 10, they've really taken the best of both worlds 
and put it together into one uh, new start menu. Um, so it's familiar. It's um, it's better than it used to be. Uh, it makes an easy transition if you're on Windows 7 and you go from Windows 7 to Windows 10. Um, you won't skip a beat in terms of functionality. Um, if you're on Windows 8, the original version of that, then this will bring you back to that familiar functionality. And if you're on Windows 8.1, 8 it's an improvement on what you've got back um, with that update. One of the things that they've added, I'm going to show you, we're going to go through these slides and then I'll show you a lot of these things um, on in an actual demo. So we'll go through the slides first and then jump to, to actually looking at some of this stuff. Um, so one of the things that was introduced in Windows 8 was the concept of a live tile, or if you have a Windows phone, you've uh, been used to those uh, for quite some time. They are a way for uh, applications to surface information. For example, the news. If you have a news tile from the news application in Windows, it can display current headlines and rotate through that information. If you have a mail tile, it can show you new mail that's coming in, uh, you know, just the subject line, who it's from, and then rotate through that information for you so you can see it at a glance. It's very easy uh, to glean what's going on. And then if you want to dive into that application to look at that uh, data in more detail, you can simply touch it or click on it and it will open the application and then you can read whatever the headline was, the news article. Uh, it gives you easy access to common applications as well. So whereas the start screen in Windows 8 where it was a full screen and you had tiles where, that you could touch or click on to launch applications, now we have smaller tiles that are on the start menu that allow us to do the same thing but without taking us to the, the big full start screen uh, that, that caused people a lot of grief in terms of uh, adapting to it. It is customizable. Uh, this is a common thing I hear about people who are using Windows 10 uh, over the last several months is they like the start menu. They are thinking that they would like to change some things about it, but for whatever reason, they assume that you can't. Um, and it's very interesting. You can uh, pin and unpin tiles from it. You can also resize it. You could make it back to the full screen, uh, start screen, if you, if you like that. There are some people who really like that in uh, Windows 8 so you can put it back that way. So Microsoft really built in the flexibility and customizability so that you can work the way you want and it's not difficult to do. I'll show you a little bit about that in a few minutes. Yeah, and hey Grant, um, I want to talk about the start menu from a political point of view that, uh, you know, I kind of feel like um, watching uh, Bernie Sanders, who now is like watching Larry David <laughs> from HBO fame. And, and I'm not getting political. It's more it's more the uh, the personality, the delivery about uh, you got your start menu. Are you happy now? Are you happy now? <laughs> and, you know, yeah. I just, you know, I did that worldwide tour on Windows 8 in uh, 30 countries uh, about 18 months ago. And Grant, that wasn't a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I'm just wondering what your, and again, it's, it's not the right word, but I want to call it political sentiments or social sentiments are because it, 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 it seemed to be um, the, the, kind of the way legislation works in a democracy, right? Making sausage isn't pretty, but the, the result's uh, nice. And that's kind of what the start menu feels like, is, is it feels like a... Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I like it, I, but you see where I'm trying to go with this. It's, it's a little bit of a concession, a little bit of a compromise. Um, but, you know, the customer's always right. So, I don't know, dude. I've spoken my piece. If you have any ideas on that. I, I, you know, I definitely and, hear and maybe what you you're should. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think the, the interesting thing about innovation is, you know, you think of... Um, these people who are trying to create something new and better out of something that's been around for a very long time. And with the change in devices, I think with the start screen, Microsoft was ahead of its time in terms of making that leap. And unfortunately, for whatever reasons, and I have no idea what they are, the decision to make that the one and only uh, 
new interface for users was startling. I remember putting Windows 8 on a computer for the first time and coming into work and you know turning on the computer and thinking what have they done to my computer you know I, yeah. I, I, I didn't understand it. Once someone explained to me that you know, oh it's the start menu but it's big it fills your screen then I was like oh I can deal with that that's not too bad and then I adapted to it very quickly and easily once I understood it, but it was definitely shocking. Um, I think that Microsoft, is, this this shows some th two things about Microsoft. One is they listen, so it may have taken a while, but engineering something like this isn't something you can do overnight. Um, so it took them a while to hear it, to really hear it, and not not think that they just have a few squeaky wheels who, did, who wanted to hang on to the old way. Um, and the second thing is they really learned from this. And uh, another thing about Windows 10 that is not on here is Microsoft is moving to a much more rapid development cycle with uh, Windows 10. It's how Windows 10 was created in the first place. And it includes getting more public feedback um, in what they call the inner circle. And there's a rapid inner circle and, a, and then a, a late inner circle. And those are people who volunteered to get uh, newer versions of the software of the operating system ahead of time and it's a it's a it's a wide swath we're not talking about a hundred people you know we're talking about tens of thousands if not millions of people who can anybody can join and then these different rings that they have so they're really working towards um, seeing that mistake of making that big change without getting enough feedback and incorporating that into their core process of how they move forward with Windows as a whole, sure. and I think that that's amazing. Okay. Hey, Grant, um, let's do this. Sanity check uh, and apologies for, for kind of, you know, waxing poetically about the societal impact of a uh, start menu, but um, we're, we're at about midpoint. We, we do have questions queued up. Folks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold off on the questions, and I'll warn you, we're probably going to go into overtime. So if that's, if that's helpful, um, I've got about six questions. Grant, why don't we rock, get into the demo, and then, then we'll take questions. Got a lot of questions. Sounds good. Okay, let's uh, let's get through the slides to set up, um, showing you uh, what Windows 10 is all about. Um, so we talked about the start menu. Let's carry forward here to uh, Windows Store apps. So I'll just go ahead and build slides out quickly. So Windows Store apps are, uh, they've been called many things. Uh, Metro apps was their original monk here. Um, today they're called modern apps or Windows Store apps interchangeably. Um, a desktop app is what we think of as a traditional uh, Windows application like QuickBooks or Word or Excel. And then modern apps are things that are more akin to the apps that you have on your phone. Well, it doesn't mean that they're any less powerful on a PC uh, than a traditional desktop app, uh, but they are different in terms of their architecture. One thing that's coming out of that is Microsoft's vision for universal applications, and that means that they're trying to make it so that a developer can write an application that will run on your PC, your tablet, your Windows phone, your Xbox, and you'll have a consistent uh, access to that application across all devices. Um, the uh, change to Windows Store and modern apps for a lot of things uh, created some headaches in Windows 8 and 8.1, just like the start menu, in that they were full screen always. And so with uh, Windows 10 now, they are uh, able to be resized, and they essentially run inside of a window, so they look and feel more like traditional Windows apps although they can still uh, run full screen. You get mouse control over them, so you can minimize them, close them, um, and, and resize them. One of the nice things about them, if the developers do it, which most do, is they adapt based on the size of the screen. So whereas things like uh, QuickBooks, when you shrink it, it just sort of gets smaller and at some point won't let you shrink it anymore because the controls won't fit on there anymore. The buttons and things uh, don't really resize that way. These things can actually completely adapt to their interface based on uh, the amount of real estate they have on your screen. That's one of the things that helps them move across devices. If you move to a very small screen, they can have a separate user interface built um, that, that is uh, optimized for that particular size screen. Um, Cortana, 
Cortana, uh, uh, I would bet that of the people that are on this call, a lot of you have iPhones. Um, in my family, we have a couple of iPhones, and I'm a, a holdout on the Windows platform. Um, Cortana is much like Siri, um, except it's uh, quite a bit more advanced in terms of its capabilities. Um, not only does it do search, but it also has applications w inside of it. A couple of them I mentioned here are things like Remind Me. Um, so for example, on my Windows phone, when I'm driving to work, I can push a button and ask Cortana to remind me to pick up milk on the way home or uh, remind me to buy paper towels next time I'm at Costco. And hey, it can do things. Yep. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Grant, I'm going to do a little trick, okay, but the stakes are high. So, uh, folks, you're welcome to do this. I'm going to do this live. I have Cortana on my uh, Nokia phone. Let me turn up the volume, um, and I'm going to say, first I'll say it here, and then I'll turn on the phone and say it, but uh, Cortana flip a coin. And so, Grant, here's the stakes, that if it's heads, um, I acquire you, and if it's tails, you acquire me. Okay, so here, 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 here we go. These are pretty high stakes. Hold on. Cortana, flip a coin. It's coming up heads. Wow, Grant, I, I think I acquire you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go on. Sounds, sounds good. I'll, and, uh, and I'll wait for the check. Dude, you'd, you'd, you'd be amazed at how VCs, I mean, it, it comes down to flipping a coin, brother, but go on. <laughs> um, so those are, those are, that's a neat thing. It's a, it's a kind of a cute function, just like if you ask Siri to tell you a joke, it actually will. Um, Cortana is, uh, they call it a personal assistant. So not only can it do things like remind you based on a time, um, it could also remind you uh, based on somebody calling you if, uh, on your phone. Um, that's more applicable, which is where most of my experience is with Cortana because it was on the phone a lot longer. Um, but one of the things that I, I use mass transit a lot, especially when I go into Seattle. And so I have my preferences in Cortana set that I like to travel by bus. So when I'm at work um, and I'm sitting at my computer, not my phone, Cortana will pop up and tell me when the last bus that I can take to get home when I normally get home. And Cortana has learned that through my phone based on me going back and forth to work. And, and it will pop up and say, you know, hey, do you come here often? It'll show you what the location is and ask you to tell her what it is. Um, like this is my house or work or the grocery store or church or whatever it happens to be. And so Cortana works across those two devices storing my information um, securely in the cloud so that whether I'm on my Surface, whether I'm on my desktop PC, or whether I'm on my phone, she will provide those kinds of tips, tricks. I can set those reminders from my phone and they'll show up on my PC and vice versa. Um, so I really have, uh, have been leveraging that application as a tool for keeping me better organized, keeping me on track, um, and we'll see later Cortana also shows up elsewhere uh, inside of Windows and provides some additional functionality there. So a ton of things that Cortana can do um, aside from just those things and the flip a coin feature and uh, those kinds of things. Um, so here's another place that Cortana shows up is in uh, Windows Edge. Um, a lot of people have heard about this because it's been in the news. Uh, Microsoft took Internet Explorer and decided to completely rebuild it from the ground up. Um, so uh, you'll see people say, you know, forget about IE um, or Internet Explorer because now there's Edge. Um, and really what they did is they built it from the ground up, but they also kept some familiar things because, uh, I mean, hey, they changed the start menu and people got upset. So things like the favorites button and those sorts of things are they're all there, um, so you won't have to completely learn something new. It's a much faster browser than Internet Explorer or a lot of the other browsers, Chrome uh, it's, and uh, Firefox. It beats those in a lot of the speed tests. 
Um, it also in, uh, incorporates Cortana into it, so Cortana can surface information based on what you're browsing uh, and provide you with additional information from the web page that you happen to be looking at. Uh, for example, if you're looking at, uh, at restaurants or at a restaurant page, Cortana could pop up, could recognize that and then pop up uh, restaurant reviews about that particular place or directions to it for you so that uh, you don't have to jump around uh, between websites to do that. And it also has a thing called a reading list. So I often go to websites and think, wow, I really want to read this article, but I don't have time right now. So I could add it to my Edge reading list, and then when I do have time, it's right there, easy for me to go to. And at the same time, it's not just bulked up on my favorites list. It is designed for HTML5 to get a little bit technical. That is kind of the newer uh, web programming language uh, that is out there. It is fairly good, not 100%, but pretty good at detecting when a website has code on it, has, is written with older technology that is not compatible or not going to work well on Edge, in which case it will tell you right away and then give you a button to open it in Internet Explorer 11. So it'll allow you to flip over to the older browser and use that. I, I see that maybe two or three times a week and it's really easy. You know, it's one extra button to click and then the website opens and renders properly in IE 11. As people adopt this, as Windows 10 becomes more prevalent, which it's doing incredibly well, we'll see web developers and companies uh, fixing up their sites and, and actually designing things for Edge, um, which will make things faster. And I expect that the other browsers will also follow suit in terms of adopting similar technologies. So uh, this is a big win for us all around because you know competition will increase um, with Chrome and Firefox, and those are only bound to get better on the coattails of Microsoft Edge. Uh, virtual desktop. So um, I work in virtualization, and this confused the heck out of me the first time I heard it. Um, but from a non-technical standpoint, virtual desktops are a way for you to stay focused when you're working in Windows. Um, I am still not an expert at using them. Not that they're complicated to use. It's more force of habit. I'll work on you know four or five different things at one time, and virtual desktops are a way to group uh, tasks into a single uh, copy of your desktop, your Windows desktop, and I'll show you what this looks like so it'll make a little more sense. Um, it's sort of simulating a multi-monitor experience. If you have more than one monitor, uh, and you may put uh, windows or programs on one monitor for something that you're working on and then may have your mail open on another one. Uh, or if you're working on two projects, you might put all the one project on one monitor and all the other project on the other one so you can switch back and forth as you need to uh, working between those. This is a way to do that um, in a very clean way and it al is also a way to do that on a single screen so that you uh, can sort of simulate that multi-monitor experience if you're working on a, a laptop or a tablet. Uh, and you need to switch back and forth between projects without cluttering up your screen with a bunch of, of different windows. Uh, very useful functionality. Mac has had this for a little while or something similar to this for a little while. Um, so it's really good to see this come to Windows and it's something that I, I am trying to use more often and I think I'll find that it becomes my new habit uh, in terms of staying organized and keeping focused. Uh, then we're going to talk about the Action Center. So the Action Center is really for notifications. It gives you fast, quick access to notifications like new mail, system messages. There's a new wireless hotspot available to you. Um, it, and it also provides quick access to common things like connecting to Wi-Fi or connecting to a VPN if you do that for work, uh, and especially if you're on a, a desktop device. Uh, and instead of having to dig through the control panel or settings application and try to remember where that thing is. Um, screen brightness, those kinds of things are all easy access right from uh, the Microsoft Action Center, which is based down by uh, the clock. So I'll show you that. 
And then uh, we have Windows Core apps. Uh, these are especially useful for consumers, but they also are viable for small business folks, uh, maybe who don't have Outlook um, and are using Office Home Edition, where you have Word and Excel, but you don't have uh, Outlook for managing your calendar and mail. Um, the, these are modern applications, they, um, but they work on oh, my little tiles on the right are from old, old another slide. Um, the, uh, the, they're modern applications, meaning that they're the newer de uh, designed applications. They change their interface based on their size. Um, and and uh, as we move into having universal applications, they'll work the same across uh, all the different vices. Uh, but they've really redesigned these to add their free applications that are included with Windows. They've got a lot more functionality and features in them than they had previously, whereas typically the basic mail app really doesn't do a whole lot. And they also integrate with your existing mail. So even for me, I have Outlook, and so that's my primary mail and calendar application. I can still use the mail application and the calendar application to see and access my business uh, mail and email there. Or if I wanted, I could, if I had a personal email account that I kept separate from business, I could have my personal mail in the mail application and use Outlook for my uh, business mail and keep those things completely separate and use that functionality based on you know whether I'm off work or, or at work. So a lot of investment made there in terms of the free apps that come with it. Um, Xbox, uh, I had to have an Xbox One uh, at my house and this was very welcome uh, in terms of adding functionality. Um, I use Xbox Live a little bit. Um, I'm not a huge gamer. Um, my kids are, and so I try to keep up with them a little bit. Uh, but your Xbox activity feed, if you use Xbox Live and play uh, games that are tied to Xbox Live, if you use things like Twitch for streaming, or if your kids do and you want to keep up with them like I do, um, your activity feed comes into the Xbox application, which is built into Windows. Um, you can also control your Xbox from your Windows, um, like if you have a tablet or even if it's a desktop PC. Uh, so if you watch TV through, for example, an Xbox One and you had a PC in your kitchen, you could control your Xbox from the kitchen by launching the uh, Xbox application on Windows 10 and uh, you, know, you could pause the television or change the channel or uh, whatever you wanted to do. And you can also stream games. Uh, or uh, applications from the Xbox onto Windows 10 devices, so you could, um, you know, watch something on your uh, tablet, for example, that was actually streaming from your Xbox. So if you had a movie playing on the Xbox and you wanted to go sit in your lazy chair in your bedroom, you could grab your tablet, connect up to the Xbox, and finish watching the movie from there, streaming directly from the Xbox. Kids love this because they can stream their games, which is very popular among uh, kids well, to kind of show off what they're doing. Yeah, and, and Grant, what I would uh, like uh, the, the, both the customers and the, the partners on the, uh, the call today to know about is that um, I, I think this is, uh, uh, I'm going to say a stake in the ground or a, a beachhead from Microsoft and the Internet of Things. Um, era that is very much at the beginning. <clears throat> That's probably a whole other webinar unto itself, and I know we're three quarters of the way through our scheduled time, folks. We're going to overtime. I'm, I'm just going to plant that seed. I'm just going to say Xbox equals IoT, and uh, we'll catch that. Maybe you know, Grant. Maybe maybe we can pick that up in a uh, webinar number three. I, I'm, I'm I'm just perfecting what I want that to be. So we'll 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 give a tip of the hat to IoT in webinar three. Please continue, so Sure, and you know that's a good point. The other thing that I will point out about Xbox, because a lot of people hear it and they think games, and so it turns them off. Microsoft's vision, from what I understand, is that Xbox is a device. It's a it's designed to be a you know a media game center um, device, but it is a very powerful computer 
and they're bringing Windows 10 to the Xbox. Um, and so what I think you're going to see is that there's going to be more, uh, again, the applications that will run across platform. And so for those of us who work kind of around the clock, whether we're home or at work, uh, the Xbox, I think, is going to be something that we will leverage for work even when we're, even though we're at home and even though it's thought of as, a, as more of a game or a media console. I saw a demo actually a couple years ago using an Xbox 360 to join what is now known as Skype for Business, um, what was back then up called Link, to join a meeting and utilize the Xbox camera and audio controls and hand gestures to actually participate in a business meeting from that. Uh, and so I think we're going to see that Xbox is not just a game and media console, but really just an extension of our Windows platform across multiple devices and something that you may see pop up in businesses uh, as something that they can use for you know, group conferencing uh, and other things of that nature. So a lot of a lot of things are going to cross. So don't rule it out if you think it's only for for games and and media, because that's that's coming in the future. Um, continuum. So this is really a term that's to, that that is centric to Windows 10, and that is, um, you know, I've said it many many times on this call that. Uh, you know, their vision is to have a consistent experience across all devices, be it a phone, um, a small tablet, a full-size tablet, a laptop, a desktop PC, the Xbox. Um, really, they are moving towards this, and they've really achieved it with Windows 10. You know, I told you I have a Surface Pro 3. Um, when I detach the keyboard or fold the keyboard back on my uh, Surface, it says, would you like to switch to tablet mode? And then I have the option of making it do that automatically when I remove the keyboard or fold it back. Um, and it will change so that, A, my finger is now the pointing device, so it changes buttons and makes things bigger. It changes the start menu from the what is currently the, the small start menu uh, back to the full screen start menu. Windows apps default. Uh, to be full screen. You get access to the on-screen keyboard. So it really knows that I've changed the way that I'm going to be working with the device and automatically adapts um, about 90% of the things. And the 10% that's not there is really developers for other applications that just haven't caught up to hooking into the capabilities of Windows 10 yet. Um, but a lot of them have already. Um, certainly, the Microsoft things like Office Outlook switches to touch mode for me, so I can I can actually navigate my email with my finger, um, and that is going to be a huge productivity benefit to people, especially as we use these um, varying devices, be it a desktop PC or a tablet or a hybrid. Um, you know, like the Surface is really more like a laptop than it is a tablet, but it's as flexible and portable as a tablet, and and I can take the keyboard off very easily um, or fold it back and use it uh, completely as a tablet. I think those are going to be more pervasive. Um, they're certainly the most popular devices that are out there now in terms of sales. Um, last bit of slides, and then we'll jump into actually looking at some of these things uh, live on Windows 10 is uh, unified settings. Um, I know it drove me nuts, especially going from Windows 7 to Windows 8, trying to find settings. So uh, essentially what happened is as they were redesigning things, they ended up having to put uh, settings in different places. So it wasn't always the, the control panel that we were used to. I um, mean, Windows 10, we now have a settings application that they've put together that has almost all of the settings. There are still a few that are hanging out in the control panel, but they're rarely used settings that you generally don't need to go to. So if you go to the new settings app, you will find all of the common things that you need to access without any trouble, um, whereas before in Windows 8, it was a bit of a uh, hit or miss whether it was going to be in settings or whether you had to go back to the control panel for it. Um, the control panel still has all of the old items that are available in the settings app, so the control panel is still complete. Um, and so if you're familiar with that, you haven't lost that, uh, but definitely want to make your way to using the settings app. And now the settings app is, as I said, it's much more complete and much easier 
to use so you don't have to go hunting around and trying to figure out uh, what's what. So let's see if I can switch to uh, so Grant, while you're doing that, let me fill a little air yep. time if you don't mind, sir. Um, folks, go for we it. have uh, about 10 minutes left in the traditional webinar format. We're going to go right up to 1 o'clock with the demo as my, my sense. Um, so we're going to go to overtime and uh, that's going to allow us to ask your questions. I've got a number of questions queued up and again this webinar is the first of three on Windows 10. Um, the audience is both partners and customers. Uh, you'll get a follow-up email with us with some of the context surrounding that some of the opportunity uh, surrounding uh, why we're doing a three webinar series. Um, Grant, I'm taking copious notes, so for my favorite note taker, one note, uh, because we have locked down webinar number two, but by design, I left webinar number three a little bit more open um, so we could see which way the wind blows and, and what topics need a further discussion, such as IoT. So, uh, Grant, there's your happy family on Bainbridge Island, sir. Um, are you ready to uh, to demo? Yep. So let's okay. go through uh, some of the things we covered here. Um, I happen to be on, uh, again, I'm using a Surface Pro 3 with Windows 10. Uh, nothing incredibly fancy um, about the setup that I have. Um, so this is pretty much an out-of-the-box Windows 10 experience. Um, I do have multiple monitors connected, so you're looking at one of actually four monitors there. Uh, but I have the uh, taskbar, the traditional taskbar, um, on all of my monitors so that you can see that. Um, I'll give you a, a quick overview here of, of any changes to the taskbar. So just like four, we can pin applications down here onto the taskbar. Uh, this is Microsoft Edge, which I'll show you in a moment. And of course, I have IE pinned there as well, in case I need to use that. Cortana is the little um, circle over here. And task view is where we get to do task switching and also access our virtual desktops, which I'll show you in a moment. So let's kind of go through um, a few, as many of these as we can get through in order. Um, so our start button's back. If I click on the start button, um, you can see I have a much larger start menu. As I mentioned, you can customize it. So I can actually drag, if I can, I should be able to drag, there we go. Um, this monitor's a little bit smaller than my other one. So I can actually drag the edges of the start menu and change that to, to meet my needs. I can also unpin things, so um, like here I can take my photos off of there. Um, Cortana's on here, you can see here's the mail application that we talked about. Um, you can see news over here, Xbox over here, so these are constantly rolling through new information. Um, the tiles are customizable, so you can again pin things, unpin things, you can see you can change the sizes on these things. Um, on the left hand side here I have you know the traditional who's logged into the computer. It surfaces my most recently used applications and then it also gives me uh, shortcuts to things that I worked on recently. So here's my presentation I was working on and uh, for PowerPoint so I have quick and easy access to that. I also have file explorer settings quick access to power, so if I want to shut my computer down, um, I can do that. And if I can't find what I'm looking for, I still have, um, as we did in uh, Windows 7, I can still type, so I can still type in Word and get access to uh, my applications here quickly and easily without, even though there's no little uh, search box there, you just click and start typing, so very easy to access. Uh, search and then of course I can go to all applications and I have the traditional uh, list of my applications that I can go and grab without um, having to go back to the full start screen. Um, if you haven't seen it, the start screen essentially looks like this right hand section here uh, but it's full screen, takes up your entire screen, the taskbar disappears and you have to scroll down and across to get to uh, applications that aren't pinned to the main uh, start screen. Uh, so Windows Store apps, uh, let's open, uh, here's a favorite of mine, 
um, it's called Formotus. This is a uh, online um, form application that's designed for Microsoft SharePoint uh, for accessing forms online. So this is one of the new modern applications. Uh, you can see I, I have the ability to resize this, whereas before in uh, Windows 8 we didn't have that ability to do uh, resize. I have the minimize, maximize, and close buttons. Um, hopefully some of you are on Windows 8 and are uh, cheering at the moment that those things are back. I also have an application menu so I can get to settings for this particular application um, without doing anything. I'll show you um, Groove, which is the new music application. Um, this is a great example of uh, when you take a, uh, an application and you change its size, you'll notice that the interface changes. So as I pull this out on the left-hand side here, I have a, a nice menu. And as I go towards the right, that menu shrinks down to this uh, small thing. And then as I continue to shrink it, the menu actually disappears. So the, the application is actually adapting to my screen size. Uh, and this is true depend not only through resizing, but if you move to a different device, um, or in my case where I have uh, multiple monitors connected up here, if I disconnect my monitors and go back to my tablet screen, which is smaller than my other monitors, it will automatically adapt that application for, um, for the screen that I'm working on. And again, if I take my keyboard off or fold it back, then I get put in tablet mode and that application will adapt to that as well. Uh, here's Cortana. Um, I have it turned off right now, but there is a function uh, where you can say, hey, Cortana. You do a, a brief voice training, takes about 60 seconds, uh, and if, as long as you have a microphone in your computer, you can say, hey, Cortana, and it, and it will actually open uh, Cortana up. And so Cortana will automatically come up here. Again, uh, they use machine learning, so they're looking for things that might be of interest to me based on searches that I've done. Uh, if you're uh, concerned about having that information out there, you can turn that stuff off. Um, so don't be fearful that your information is out there and they're using it to learn about you. If you don't want to opt into that, you can certainly opt out. Uh, you can see the little microphone so I can do it by voice. And then you can see the applications that exist for uh, Cortana. So she has the ability to search for restaurants, um, get you directions, transit, look up movies. Um, uh, Cortana will detect travel plans inside your email. So if you get an email from Expedia saying that you're flying to Hawaii, uh, if, uh, if that happens, Cortana, the first time Cortana will ask you if you want to, uh, to track travel through Cortana, you say yes, and then from there on out it'll grab your flight information, remind you, alert you if your flight's delayed, um, and again this works cross the device if you have a, a, a Windows uh, phone with Cortana on it. Um, and then there's the uh, remind me, so you can see uh, different reminders. I'm not going to let it load fully so that um, you don't see all my, remi my personal reminders on there. Um, and then there's also this provide feedback. This again is one of Microsoft's pushes towards getting feedback from customers. So if you like something, don't have an idea, you can put it in here, hit send, and it actually gets back to uh, the development team and they they read those things. They do do some uh, aggregation, uh, but somebody actually reads those things and they take those to heart, especially if they get a lot of requests for a particular feature or people who found a problem and uh, those get accelerated based on the number of people who uh, are in there. I'm going to skip the um, Edge browser real quick and go to the virtual desktops piece because I think it's uh, it's incredibly useful. Um, so if I click on this, hopefully you can see this. I'm not sure how it comes across on GoToPC or GoToMeeting. Um, can you, uh, Carrie, can you see that it says desktop one and desktop two on the bottom of my screen? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can. It's small. The very bottom, yeah, small. Okay. So this is my ability to have multiple desktops. To, so to give you an example of what this looks like, I can have an application like, um, I can't spell apparently, um, 
like Notepad, we can have that on there. And then I can click on this and I can go to Desktop 2 and you'll notice Notepad disappeared. Um, so I could launch another instance of Notepad and this could be any application. I'm just using Notepad because it's simple. This is on Desktop number 2. And then if I want to switch back, I just click this and I go to Desktop 1. So very clean and easy. I can have you know, 25 windows open on one desktop, click this, switch over to project, the other project that I'm working on, and have access to that without having to, to go um, to minimize windows and try to keep myself organized. And if I need to move something, I can go to the screen. It sh it'll show me all the applications running on that desktop. I can right click it, choose move to desktop 2, it disappears off desktop 1, and now on desktop 2 I have both of those instances of Notepad for my use. So that's a really cool feature. Again, it's something that takes a little bit of practice into working into your, your work habit, um, but it's a great way to stay organized and keep things separated without having to close them all. Um, I know we're we're at time, and so why don't we take questions, and that way people who are planning on jumping off can, and if anybody wants to stay on, we can go through some other things as we have time. That's right. That's right. Why don't we do this? So a uh, great audience today, and cer certainly a compelling and current topic. So Grant, we're going to... We're going to move pretty quick. Uh, some of these questions, folks, I'm going to hold off on until the next webinar or the uh, the third webinar. Um, for, for example, there's an Office 365 question, which is really more appropriate for the third webinar. So uh, number one, uh, media, Windows Media Center was removed from Windows 10. Does Microsoft plan to make it available in any way, or is there a workaround to regain that functionality? Um, I know they took it out. I have heard nothing in terms of them bringing things back in. Um, I'm not a Windows Media Center user, so I don't know if there's a workaround um, to that on Windows 10. It's a great question, and uh, I'll certainly look at it and see if I can come up with an answer. But as far as I know, no. Yeah, and Grant, what I'm doing is I'm copying and pasting that one into a little uh, parking lot, so we'll deal with it later. Uh, you've already answered the question about websites on Edge. I'm going to move on past that, gentlemen. Uh, so the next question is, is a Windows 10 available? Does anyone know? So Windows 10 has cert. Yeah, so repeat that one more time. Windows 10? Yeah, a, a, a Windows 10, I'm, I'm assuming a certificate. I, I'm assuming it's not a certification. Um, is a Windows 10 cert available? Maybe, maybe it's certification, like, you know, the old MCSE. Um, or is it a certificate? But a certificate's kind of a, a different, that's a different paradigm than an operating system. You know what I mean? That's yes. kind of a third-party certificate issue. Or, Grant, let's assume it's a certification. Um, uh, folks, I'm going to look that up. I'm going to assume the answer is yes, because, boy, howdy, if Microsoft knows anything, it's how to create curriculums. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> how so, to make you pass, pass tests. Yeah, so. I put that in the parking lot. Grant, the next question is, uh, uh, all your programs came back uh, like QuickBooks would automatically come back ready to use. That's an upgrade question. Would a program like QuickBooks be ready to use? So I think they were referring to my restore um, situation okay. where I ran over my, my Surface Pro. Um, but I'll address both. So first on the upgrade question, Microsoft has tested literally tens of thousands of applications in upgrading from Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows 8.1 to Windows 10 and worked with vendors to mitigate things. Um, I've done a lot of Windows 10 upgrades and not run into any problems except for one, and that had to do with uh, corporate VPN clients. So for those techies on here, make sure you uninstall your VPN clients before you upgrade to Windows 10, and then reinstall Windows 10 compatible VPN clients um, when you get to the other side. Um, but other than that, application-wise, not an issue. In terms of my uh, restoring my data from my Surface, no, that's not. QuickBooks would not automatically come back. My data would be there, um, assuming I, again, had set up the backup. So I can't underline, underscore, highlight that enough. 
that sure. uh, by default there is no backup other than your settings. When you launch Windows 10, it'll ask you if you want to save your settings on your OneDrive, which is free. Um, and you say yes to that, that'll get your wallpaper and uh, those favorites and those kinds of things. But as far as your data, you need to go into the backup setting on Windows and point it somewhere. Typically, that's an external drive. Um, I have a little desktop machine at my house that I call a server. Um, it's not really a server. It's just a desktop machine that has storage on it. And so that's where all our stuff gets backed up to. So it would store my QuickBooks database file, but I would actually have to go and reinstall my uh, QuickBooks application. If the Windows Store app, then you can do some restores there. Uh, there are some some specific cases when you do a system restore where it will know what you had installed and since you bought them through the Windows Store, if they were free through the Windows Store, you know that you owned them, had them installed, and it'll it'll put those back on your uh, device for you, or worst case, you okay. go to the Windows Store and click the button and they come down. That's right. Uh, you've already answered uh, the next question on edge compatibility and classic IE, so I'm not going to ask that. Uh, you have answered the backup setting question just now, thank you. So uh, show us how to access and add to the reading list, please, reading list. So that is on, go to, and Grant, while you're doing that, uh, the, the folks, the 365 questions in the Office 2016 question, Matt, your question on Office two, 2016, I'm going to go ahead and defer that to webinar number three, where that's more appropriate, and uh, Grant, we're going to stay, stay spot on with the uh, topic at hand. So let's um, let's go here. This is MSN. Let's say I get to I just randomly picked an article. Let's say I get here and I go, oh, I want to read this thing about Whole Foods, and I want to read it later. So I'll go up to my favorites button, and now I have these two options. I have favorites, and I have my reading list. So I pick my reading list. I say add. Now it's on my reading list um, to access later, as you can see. Um, so my reading list is on. Uh, is available to me next time I go there. And again, it's it's the, it's like favorites. It's exactly like favorites, except that it's separate. And so that way I don't clutter up my favorites list with, um, you know, I don't clutter up my favorites list with things that I'm only going to look at once. And the other thing that happens uh, is when I did that, Windows popped this up. And so it gives me a quick overview when you first are doing this. Uh, it'll pop up a quick overview to remind you how to do it and what it's about. Edge also, the first time you launch it, will give you show you a tutorial, much like IE always has when you upgrade it to a new version, and it'll show you how to do things like you can actually write on web pages and then share those out. Uh, and you have the reading list and some other features and functionality that exist um, inside Edge that they've added to it. So this is a really great um, thing, and this is always accessible. This is called the Getting Started Guide. So this is built into Windows 10, so you can click on any of these and learn about um, new technology like Cortana and Edge and Xbox and all those kinds of things uh, sure. right from here. Okay, Grant, yes or no? Virtual desktops are like Unix sessions, yes or no? Yes. Okay. Um, next, uh, is the Windows Mail Core app available to handle multiple email accounts? Yes. Just business and personal. Yes. Wow, we got you in yes and no mode. I love it. Um, <laughs> uh, next question, lightning round. Uh, my search does not work. Uh, any tips on that? I cannot even type in the search box. Uh, Grant, I, I can't begin to imagine why that is the case. I have no idea. Um, I mean, it, if you're on Windows 10 and you're talking about a search box, there isn't a, um, you know, there isn't really a search box here. There's probably a setting somewhere that allows you to turn um, on the, for the start menu that may allow you to turn search off for the, um, start menu, uh, but I'm not sure of that, and, uh, you know, I could certainly, if you want to reach out, I can try to dig into that for you if you want. 
and see um, if it's a different operating system like Windows 7 or something like that. <coughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, what about uh, I can't really make. What about Microsoft snooping in Windows 10? Um, that's a uh, uh, Grant. I'll take that one. That's that's a huge body of of work. Uh, we'll take that one offline. I'll actually put that over to webinar three. So whoever asked about Microsoft snooping in Windows 10, I want to develop a better presentation on that. We're going to put that over to webinar three. I, I understand what the question is. Um, I, I, I want to have the proper context surrounding it. Uh, the webinar is not live because we're not waiting. No. no, the webinar is live. Um, how, how, do you, how do you get how do you get just the Cortana circle to show in the taskbar and not the search box, not the uh, the wide search box? So Cortana circle to show in the taskbar. Grant, any idea on that, sir? Oh. Uh, I think you can, yeah. So you're looking at this is what they're talking about. So I have Cortana, just this little circle down here. Um, I probably can't do it from this monitor. Let me switch monitors here. Uh, okay, so can you see this screen, Harry? Uh, should I be able blue. to see. I at, yeah, I just see a blue. Should screen. be glue. Am I? Uh, let's go. Oh, that because it's clean. There we go. How about okay. now? Uh, yeah, I see. So I should be. You should yeah, see. Ask me problem. anything. No, hang on. I got. I got to make my screen smaller. Hang on. I'm, I'm not I just want to make sure they can they can see the taskbar. So yeah. Um, yeah. I'm hovering over the Cortana. Okay. Yeah, so if I right click on Cortana. And then I, or, or I, probably anywhere, yeah, anywhere on the taskbar, if I go to the Cortana options, I can hide Cortana, I can have the Cortana icon, or I can check the show text box. This is how it comes when you use Windows 10. It, it comes like this, and uh, the person asking probably has Windows 10, and it's driving them nuts that it's there. So you just right-click your taskbar, go to Cortana, and do show Cortana icon, and then it'll shrink down. Otherwise, you get the um, search box, and I wonder if that's the the person who was asking about the search box. I forgot that I that I hid this this particular search box, um, which is actually Cortana um, and not the the start menu. There we go, sir. Um, Grant, let's keep moving along, folks. We're a little bit over time today, but boy, we kept the bulk of the audience, so I know. The, the we're on to something. Um, are the virtual desktop sessions isolated at all for security reasons? So uh, virtual sessions no. isolated for security. Nope. Okay. Um, next question. Through virtualization, I can control two simultaneous outgoing audio streams. Uh, oh, can I? Can I control two uh, audio streams? So two disparate audio jacks and cards. I, I do a lot with sound and radio and streaming. That's a great question. Grant, I, I don't know. I have not a clue. Not my specialty um, doing audio streaming nor audio streaming through virtualization. Yeah, I'm going to put that over to webinar three. So I have a little, I have a little cheat sheet, as I told you. Um, Grant, let me go back to the chat. We're getting close. Uh, folks, uh, what happens when you have multi multiple computers you log on to regarding backup? Multiple computers and regarding the backup. So um, as I mentioned during the restore, it asked me if I wanted to restore uh, from a backup and I could have said no. Um, Windows obviously gives a unique machine name to each uh, computer and so it will know what the backup is for each of those different computers, so you won't run into an issue of, um, uh, you know, them colliding with each other or overwriting each other or trying to restore one to the other. Um, 
a couple of things there. One is um, if I had multiple backups when I went to restore, it would ask me which one. So I obviously got a new device. It probably is going to get a new name when I, by default, it's going to have a new name when I launch it, unless it's part of a domain or um, something like that where there's a lot more control going on, and then there's probably different backup processes in place altogether. Um, so then it would ask me, you know, which one do you want to restore from, um, so that I could get the right data back onto the right machine. Um, the other thing about that is using uh, OneDrive or OneDrive for Business. Uh, so OneDrive is free. Um, you get, uh, I think, a terabyte, not a terabyte. You get, you can get like 15 gigs of free storage with Microsoft. Uh, you have to, I think you have to do a couple things. It might be seven, and then you if you upload your pictures well, from your mobile changing. device, they yeah, give you more. Changing. They, they've announced some changes. So, in fact, you know what I'm going to do because that's a 365 concept grant. Let's let's take OneDrive uh, storage since that just changed. Uh, we'll we'll pick that up in webinar number three. That's a that's a perfect yeah. 365 concept, and it just changed like yesterday. Grant, the final question, and then we're uh, we're, we're not too bad. It's basically 115 in Seattle. Uh, final question today, folks. Uh, any image? Backup uh, will any image any image backup work for full restore? Um, I, I think I understand what they're asking. Is that a third-party question or a native question? Image backup work for full restore. So in Windows 8 or 8, I think in Windows 8, um, they took away sort of <clears throat> Windows backup, um, which was an image-based backup of the device. Uh, whatever that device may be to an ex some type of external storage. For those of you who maybe are not quite as technical, an image-based backup means essentially making a copy at the hard drive level so that all of your files, including Windows and everything, are all completely backed up. And I had experience with this um, back around the time of the release of the Surface Pro 2, and I actually spent, I mean, not I didn't actually sit and wait for it, but it actually I actually spent about eight hours doing a complete uh, image-based backup of a Windows 8 device before I moved over to a, uh, a replacement Surface Pro 2, and I was really worried about that. And that's actually when I discovered that the reason they sort of hid Windows backup and doing image-based backups is because if you're using these other things, OneDrive for settings, and using just the regular Windows, what they call file history, which saves all your data, uh, then there really is no need to do the image backup. However, um, as we know, like we talked about, there are QuickBooks and other applications, and you might want to literally restore to a point in time for that machine that is still, as far as I know, available using PowerShell or a third-party application inside of Windows, so you can still do a full image-based backup if you want to do. Um, I'm very fond of like Storage Craft and um, Acronis are uh, great uh, products that are out there that will still do image-based backup, so you can still do that. There's no reason you can't. That's right. Okay, well, Grant, with that said, and folks, thank you so much for making this not only one of the uh, longest, but also largest webinars of the year. Grant, I checked this morning, we had over 175 attendees, and that's that's a good number for SMB Nation. So um, appreciate you attending. Uh, I see a couple Johnny Come Lately questions. Um, okay, we'll take these two, but folks, that's it, because we got to get people back to the salt mine. So, um, Okay, the OneDrive question, sir, I'm going to take to webinar three. So that's a 365 concept. I will take this question. Um, aside from being able to join a domain, what are the major differences between home and business versions of uh, Windows 10? Oh, boy, you're stretching my... Um, uh, we can push it. Actually, you know, why, I can... why don't we push that to webinar two, because that's the deployment. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I have the answer, just not out of my head, uh, and uh, I can certainly, I was about to pull up a slide that has it on it, but it would take me a minute to find it, so uh, wait, um, let's, yeah, let's that's just, a per I, perfect let's thing for, for the next R2. one. No, that's exactly the topic. I mean, folks, I appreciate your enthusiasm, but we're, we're, we're uh, by golly, we're doing the best to stay as close to the agenda as we can. Um, the final comment, Harry, that's enough war stories. Okay, so noted. We'll get more serious. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Grant, uh, thank you so much for your time, sir, folks. Thank you for your time. 
we are over time, so we will reconvene in a week with the uh, the second Windows 10 webinar. Have a have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.